I'm Selena Wang. This is the best of Bloomberg Technology, where we bring you all of our top interviews from this week in tech. Coming up, Lyft ramping up plans to file its IPO. Will the ride-hailing startup attract investors in the public market? Plus, highlights from Samsung Unpacked. The smartphone maker debuts its most extensive lineup of devices, taking aim at Apple and rising competition from China. Plus, the global race for 5G. President Trump says he wants telecoms to embrace the new technology, but what exactly will give the U.S. an edge? We'll speak with FCC Commissioner Brendan Carr. But first to our top story. Lyft could file its IPO as soon as next week and plans to target a valuation of 20 to $25 billion. Both Uber and Lyft had both been planning their IPOs for the first half of the year, and it appears the latter is on track to go public first. We discussed Lyft's IPO strategy on Thursday with Bloomberg's Olivia Zaleski and Jacqueline Strife, Oceanic Partner COO and Lyft investor. Because of the market shutdown, um, or the government shutdown, excuse me, there hasn't been an IPO in about over 15 weeks. And so there's a lot of pent up demand for, to see a really big um, Lyft, uh, excuse me, a tech company IPO. And so I think it's going to be well received. I think the company uh, Lyft is doing very well. I think and people are really excited to see what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, just to add right. to that, I think they really want to go. Like yesterday they want to come out because you know uber is sort of waiting in the wings and they don't want to have a situation where uber is coming in and like sucking up all the air out of the room you know they're sort of the bigger fish here and they really um, want so to set the story right, right so they're rushing they're trying to get this out quickly um, they also don't want uber to really like define what ride hailing looks like they don't want them to define the story here they want to be the ones to come out and say this is our our company let's focus on you know we're a domestic company we're not trying to be this global ride hailing giant we're doing things well here in the US so it's important for them to get out ahead of uber right so they have an opportunity to explain why the smaller underdog is a great investment right so I mean what have we heard from potential shareholders is there a lot of interest for this stock yeah, I mean, the, the people I spoke with today seem really excited, and they're eager to see Lyft go first. So, you know, it goes back to this idea that they want them to be yep. out ahead, to set the stage. To They don't want Uber coming in and dominating the, the story. But I think certainly on their roadshow, you're going to expect a lot of questions about uh, Uber on Lyft's IPO, uh, IPO roadshow and vice versa. Um, you know, shareholders seem uh, extremely interested in the company. You know, you have Fidelity, who's already an investor in Lyft, so it'll be interesting to see what happens there like how much they end up continuing to buy into the company for sure and you're an investor yeah. in Lyft Oceanic got involved pretty early on so what did you see in the company back then yeah so it was about 2015 um, when we invested in the company um, it's my you know we have guys at our firm that look at the numbers I personally look more at the relationships and the personalities and the story behind the business and you know hands down Lyft has People like Lyft. People want to see Lyft be successful. Um, I took a Lyft here to get here, and you know everyone just can't say great things about Lyft and how they treat people, how they treat you know women and all of their you know their employees and the people that they ride with. And so, I'm really excited to see where the company goes. I'm excited for the employees that I've worked with, the people that I've met in upper management. I mean, I think everyone deserves a really good IPO, and uh, I'm you know we've been waiting for four years now, and so it'll be really exciting. And now both of the companies, Lyft and Uber, are losing money I mean how do you see public investors stomaching those losses you know I think a lot of tech companies uh, are not profitable um, but I know that Lyft is really working towards increasing their margins um, you know they're trying to increase their market share within the US they are have a more streamlined strategy um, they don't spend as much money as uber um, and they're really trying to um, you know expand um, socially and consciously and and I do think that they're they're gonna get there um, but it's gonna you know I think they have to tell their story but they're slowly getting there by explaining and expanding in all the cities around the um, and the, around the US and how concerned are you and potentially maybe you're hearing this from your sources about the risk of regulation and some of these minimum pay requirements that are in very important cities like New York City you know um, that's a good question I think 
it, you're going to see regulations in in all sorts of um, different companies, whether it's ride sharing or you know the Airbnbs of the world. Um, but I, you know, they're all going to work together. I think at the end of the at the end of the day, what they want to do is make. Um, transport more efficient in cities. Uh, they want to make it efficient, they want to make it, you know, worth it, uh, easier for, for the end user. Um, and I think they're going to work with cities to make it the most efficient and, and pay what they need to pay and, and, make, and do the right and thing. And Olivia, I want to touch on Pinterest. They just confidentially filed for an IPO. I mean, what was their thinking about that around the timing? I know, they just keep coming, they keep coming. Every Can't catch day, a break. <laughs> I know, as a new IPO reporter, I feel like every day there's a new one. So yeah, Pinterest confidentially filed. You know, I think they're gonna be one of many that are gonna, we're gonna expect to see go. Probably They'll probably end up going around the summertime. Um, a lot of interest in them and excitement about them as well. And really briefly on Lyft, what about picking the NASDAQ over the New York Stock Exchange? I mean, what's the significance of that? Yeah, I think NASDAQ is sort of a hot place to go for tech companies. It's interesting that Lyft ended up getting NASDAQ. It sort of, you know, begs the question of where will Uber end up? Um, you know, NASDAQ is, is popular for tech companies uh, for a number of reasons. Right now, I think they're up about 13%. Um, you get a big splashy presentation when you go there. Um, so, you know, I think it makes sense that they, they end up there and we'll see what happens with Uber. That was Bloomberg's Olivia Zaleski and Jacqueline Strife from Oceanic Partners. Coming up, Samsung unveils a smartphone with a price tag that nearly tops $2,000. Is a foldable phone frenzy the next big trend for consumers? And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. The wait is over. At the Samsung Unpacked event, the company unveiled the biggest redesign of its marquee Galaxy smartphone in San Francisco. The South Korean tech giant introduced four new phones, taking on Apple with new low-end premium models, 3D cameras, an in-screen fingerprint scanner, and 5G connectivity. And part of the revamp is a foldable phone. The Galaxy Fold has a 4.6-inch screen when used as a phone and can unfold into a tablet with a 7.3-inch screen, allowing users to use up to three applications at once. Bloomberg Technologies' Mark Gurman attended the event and spoke with Emily Chang on Wednesday. This is going to be the first mass market folding phone we've seen. And the price is about $2,000. It's $1,980, which would make it the absolute most expensive name brand phone on the market. So uh, talk to us about what specifically you see will be a real competitor to Apple here. I think on the hardware side, what Samsung is coming out with is quite impressive. For the flagship models, aside from the foldable, it's four devices. There's one 5G device at the high end, which means Samsung is going to be at about a year and a half advantage over Apple and 5G, based on our reporting. Also a low-end phone, the S10e, to take on the iPhone XR. It actually looks similar to the XR. And some of the advancements they have in the camera space seem pretty impressive as well. But I've had a chance to use some of the phones in, in recent days, and while the hardware seems ahead of Apple at least one to two years in terms of some of the camera technology, 3D sensing, and of course 5G, I still think Apple's ahead on the software side and the services integration. Right, and you've reported that Apple isn't working on 5G at least this year, but maybe it'll come next year, we don't know. Do you think that 5G capability will really be a draw for consumers this year? I think so in terms of the marketing prowess and pushes we're seeing from companies like Verizon and AT&T. Will there be enough people this year in the U.S. to take advantage of 5G? It's not clear, but at least by the first half of 2020, 5G is going to be in a lot of markets across the U.S. The problem for Apple is that the company usually releases its new phones around September, October, and November of every calendar year. So unless Apple pushes their iPhone release up in 2020 or comes out with a specialized 5G version earlier in the year, they're going to be at least six months or so behind on 5G. That was Bloomberg's Mark Gurman. John Butler of Bloomberg Intelligence also joined Emily to weigh in on how Samsung's newest devices fit into the global smartphone landscape. I think the new products look terrific, Emily. I really was surprised at the quality of the screens, the fingerprint technology, all that I think makes Samsung very competitive. 
I think the one thing to keep in mind here, though, is that they're really not competing with Apple with these phones, in my view, as much as they're competing with sort of these rising Chinese vendors that have very, very good devices at really low price points. So what do you think will convince consumers to upgrade? I mean, we know in general that the smartphone market is slowing. You know, what do these products offer that you know, prior phones don't? Phones are lasting longer. People just don't need to upgrade. So why do it? I think that's a problem that we're going to live with for a while in this industry. And you can see it reflected in the shipment decline we saw this year with um, roughly a 4 to 5 percent decline in the market in 2018. I think the next big push to upgrade is likely to be 5G. I think the foldable phone introduced by Samsung today is a move in the right direction, but I'm not sure it quite gets them there in terms of sparking upgrade activity. So how does this position Samsung to compete with the Chinese handset makers, which are offering often at cheaper prices, half price or even less, phones that some would say work just as well? Well, I mean, Samsung right now has been almost literally pushed out of the Chinese market by these vendors. So Xiaomi is on that list, Huawei, Vivo, Oppo, uh, all with great devices. But I think as you look more broadly across the world, there's a lot of behavior, buying behavior aimed at buying good quality devices with really good displays. I think the display is becoming more and more important as video traffic grows as a percent of the total mobile traffic out there. People really are migrating to video, and I think Samsung has an edge there with its displays. So how might you expect the market share chart, the global smartphone market share chart, to look different at the end of this year uh, than, say, it does right now? So Samsung, that's a great question. Samsung's share has been roughly flat for the past couple of years. And I think on the strength of this upgrade cycle, the introduction of the 10e, which is the lower price Galaxy, the foldable phone, I imagine you'll see their share trend up just a little bit. Uh, I suspect Apple's going to be stable to maybe down a little bit, uh, depending on what we see in September. And then with the Chinese vendors, sort of steady as she goes. Chinese search giant Baidu gave an upbeat forecast for the fiscal first quarter Thursday. The company projected that revenue will rise 12 to 18 percent in the quarter ending in March as new content and products help energize its advertising business. Baidu is spending billions on AI and younger services like its newsfeed as it fights off rivals like Alibaba and ByteDance amid a slowing economy. Joining us to discuss is Bloomberg's Stephen Engel in Hong Kong. So Stephen, it looks like things were a little bit better than expected. Break down the numbers for us. Yeah, they were better than expected because we even heard from uh, the chairman, Robin Lee, earlier saying, you know, it's going to be a chilly time in 2019 for Chinese companies. And I guess he was alluding to the fact, of course, of the trade war. And that could affect as well the slowing Chinese economy. And then that would have a knockdown effect, of course, on advertising. Baidu relies heavily or more so uh, than its bigger rivals like Tencent and Alibaba on advertising. So that's what we, we, what we were really looking at is advertising spending and also the top line growth. So fourth quarter adjusted profit beat estimates $1.92 per ADR. Uh, we were expecting $1.74. Also a fourth quarter revenue beat even the highest of the uh, estimates. Uh, the consensus was $3.89 billion. It came in at $3.96. Basically new content and products have been energizing the ad business better than uh, even probably Robin Lee had expected. So going beyond Baidu, I mean, how has the broader Chinese online advertising industry uh, held itself up against the macroeconomic concerns, the trade tensions? Yeah, so what, what they're trying to do is, of course, bolster their advertising business, but at the same time, they need to build out uh, their new services uh, that can complement that and become less reliant on advertising. They want to kind of take the WeChat model from Tencent and build what's called a super app, an, uh, an app that can uh, provide so many different services. So you mentioned some of those other services. Uh, it includes uh, AI-driven content uh, throughout that platform. There 
are also separately building another division, uh, the Apollo Autonomous Driving. They have their news feed. And another big one, too, that they uh, are seeing some traction on is their Netflix-like video service, ITE. So, you know, it's, it's going to be a work in progress through this year with tough economic conditions and headwinds uh, on global trade on the advertising space. Uh, but Baidu, given these numbers, uh, I'm sure Robin Lee is fairly pleased uh, that that gives them a little bit of momentum going into what he already said is going to be a chilly year in 2019. Right. And in addition to those macro factors, there's also a crop of new startups, notably ByteDance, which is valued yeah. at billions and billions of dollars. It's actually the most valuable startup in the world right now. I mean, are we seeing those companies impact Baidu's advertising revenue? Yeah, absolutely we are because as the economy is slowing, advertising rates are coming down and upstarts like ByteDance are siphoning off some of that ad spend. And keep in mind as well, uh, Alibaba has done much better of late in the advertising space. They had been more on the, uh, the laggard side on advertising as they focused more on e-commerce. But their advertising uh, business has also picked up. So sure, Baidu has to pick up its game on advertising and that's why they are trying to mix in all these other services and that's what brought down operating profit I might add in the fourth quarter uh, it was about half what it was a year ago simply because they are spending so much on other services and new content coming up Walmart posted strong sales growth over the holiday quarter as it continues to push into e-commerce where it now stands in competition with Amazon up next Plus, we speak to FCC Commissioner Brendan Carr about the global race for 5G and how the U.S. can gain an edge over global competition. This is Bloomberg. Some good news for retail. Walmart brushed off the industry's disappointing December sales Tuesday with its best holiday quarter in a decade. The retail giant's fourth quarter U.S. comparable sales beat expectations, while its e-commerce sales rose 43 percent in the fourth quarter. But while the company continues to take on Amazon, its push into online sales is weighing on margins. E-marketer principal analyst Andrew Lipsman in Chicago and Bloomberg Opinion Sarah Halzek joined Emily Chang to weigh in on the results Tuesday. I think they showed some real strength in a couple of key categories. Uh, one was toys. So they had expanded their assortment online by 40%. They knew this was the first Christmas without Toys R Us, and they badly wanted to claim that market share, and it appears they did get quite a big piece of it. Uh, the other element is grocery. Uh, Walmart's been investing a lot in grocery delivery and in click and collect grocery, and this is an area where they have a real advantage because their fleet of stores is so large, uh, and that was another source of strength for them on the digital front in the quarter. Andrew, what would you single out? I mean, Walmart's got a redesigned website. They went after Toys R Us buyers. You know, what in particular do you think helped Walmart close the deal? Yeah, I mean, I think they're really firing on all cylinders across every channel. Brick and mortar has been really strong. They've invested in their store experience, and that's bringing consumers back. Online, obviously, was the headline here with 43% growth. Um, and I would also echo Click and Collect as being a huge driver. And especially where a lot of other retailers faltered late in the season, Walmart, uh, Amazon as well, but Walmart in particular was able to get a lot of those last minute sales because of their strong om omni channel and click and collect execution. So let's talk about the competitive landscape and Amazon in particular. I've got a chart here in my GTV library which shows, compares the market caps of Amazon and Walmart. Amazon in the blue, obviously much higher market cap uh, than Walmart, but when you look at revenue, Walmart brings in far more revenue than Amazon. Now, when you look at profit, Amazon's profits dwarf Walmart, but it certainly shows a lot of interesting, uh, conflicting trends at play. How do investors see this story, Sarah? I think that they see that uh, Walmart is finding its niche and finding its strength. Um, you know, Amazon, its growth is slowing down. It remains the undisputed leader with, you know, 50 cents of every dollar spent online going to Amazon. And that is tough to compete with. But Walmart is trying to find its niche, not only with programs like Click and Collect, but by building these this sort of galaxy of other businesses where it can core a different type of customer than it can through the main Walmart brand. This is why you saw it by Bonobos. This is 
why it bought Eloquy, this is why it bought Bear Necessities, and this is how it's trying to steer the Jet.com brand that, it's owned, that it owns. It's really trying to focus on an affluent urban millennial customer there, a customer who perhaps wouldn't shop at Walmart uh, under other circumstances. So uh, Walmart is trying to build this kind of stable of brands that meets customers in different places, and that's sort of unique compared to what Amazon is doing. But Andrew, is Walmart, even online, ever going to be able to squeeze the amount of profit that Amazon is squeezing from its customers? Well, a big part of a Amazon's growth is their profitability, which comes from adjacent businesses with AWS and their fast-growing advertising business. And those businesses have a totally different margin profile. So I think the big question here is uh, Walmart's core retail business is moving in the right direction. Uh, but are they going to be able to layer on some of these more profitable business lines? They've talked a bit about uh, the advertising business. It's still small, but I think they wield a ton of potential there. Um, Amazon has a really big head start, but I think that's something to watch over the next couple of years if they can layer on a much more profitable, profitable business, um, leveraging the enormity of c customer data that they have at their disposal. Now, Sarah, how is the grocery battle shaping up? Walmart is the leader, but of course Amazon in that territory and other grocery chains doing more delivery as well. Yeah, so Walmart has really strong geographic coverage. I think they said something like 70% of the U.S. population is covered by their pickup services now, and the delivery uh, for the delivery service is somewhere in the more 30% range. That's pretty strong coverage. And when you compare what Amazon is working with, Whole Foods has only 400 some odd stores compared to the thousands of Walmart stores. Uh, that's a real advantage for Walmart. But there's no question that the dynamics are changing. You know, Kroger, which is a major grocer um, and major competitive force in this space has struck a deal with Ocado, where Ocado, the innovative uh, British grocery giant, is going to be uh, bringing its technology over to the states, its automated warehouse technology, to help Kroger ramp up its click and collect and delivery game. And so uh, this is a fast-moving, fast-changing landscape. And, you know, it's, it's so little penetrated, whereas certain categories now are 30, 40 percent online. Grocery is just 2 percent online. I think it's really anybody's game. Meantime, the CEO of Walmart, Andrew, is saying that the online sales strength is actually weighing on gross margin. How do they intend to combat that? The, the online sales strength? Um, right. You know, I, I, th I think that right now a lot of where that's coming from is Flipkart. And they know in the near term that Flipkart's going to be a drag on those margins. Um, but really that's a long-term play. So India is potentially this massive, massive market. Um, I think everyone's hoping that it becomes the next China as an e-commerce market. That may be a little bit ambitious. Nevertheless, um, it's about how that plays out over the next five to ten years. So in the near term, they're going to have to incur some of that uh, hit. But I think that it's smart strategically, and they seem to be uh, guiding the street to understand what that's going to mean to their margins. Uh, of course, Sarah, that Flipkart acquisition was hotly contested. How, what do we know about how well the acquisition is going? So we don't know that much yet. I think what everyone was watching for today was we just learned about these new e-commerce regulations that are going into effect in India, which create some challenges for both Walmart and Amazon as uh, foreign participants in that market. And we did hear CEO Doug McMillan say on the call today that Walmart is disappointed uh, with those regulations and is going to have to figure out how to work within them. Um, but I think it's noteworthy that they did not adjust the guidance, right? They had issued annual guidance in October and they did not revise that today. So I think that's a, a clue to us that while they will have some work to do to adapt to these regulations and the challenges they present, they don't perceive them to be catastrophic for their progress on Flipkart. And as was mentioned earlier, Flipkart is really a long-term play, uh, and they're going to be watching how that evolves over a years-long period. That was eMarketer Principal Analyst Andrew Lipsman and Bloomberg Opinion Sarah Halzik there. Coming up... President Donald Trump argued U.S. companies must take the lead in the global race to build next-generation wireless networks. But what does that really entail? We'll hear from FCC Commissioner Brendan Carr. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology. And be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the Best of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Selena Wang. 
For years, the world has been looking ahead to 5G, the next generation of wireless networks, as the solution to growing demands for mobile data. Now, President Trump is weighing in on the issue. He tweeted, I want 5G and even 6G technology in the United States as soon as possible. It is far more powerful, faster, and smarter than the current standard. American companies must step up their efforts or get left behind. There is no reason that we should be lagging behind on something that is so obviously the future. I want the United States to win through competition, not by blocking out currently more advanced technologies. We must always be the leader in everything we do, especially when it comes to the very exciting world of technology. Now, we caught up with FCC Commissioner Brendan Carr in Washington on Thursday and asked him about F5G deployment in the U.S. Well, at the Federal Communications Commission where I work, we've been really focused on 5G for about two years now and getting the U.S. ready for this really transformative from a technology and an economic perspective as well. And there's a U.S. delegation going to Barcelona at the end of this week. Where we're going to be talking some more uh, about 5G. But how should we understand the meaning of his tweets? His statement that the U.S. should win through competition, not by blocking advanced technology, seems to conflict with reports that the White House may be doing an executive order to block uh, telecommunication companies like Huawei. Yeah, there's a couple issues going on here. One, when you look at this global race to 5G and which country is going to be first to deploy this new technology, China has a very different system uh, than the U.S. does in terms of command and control. In the U.S., what we've been focused on is trying to get the government out of the way and let our private sector invest and compete. And at the FCC, we've been updating our regulations to help spur the private sector's investment and deployment of 5G. But is there anything in those tweets that suggests a softer stance towards Huawei? I would know the, uh, the president's thinking on those particular tweets, but we've been very active, whether it's in Congress uh, through legislation. The White House hosted a 5G summit earlier in the year. Uh, and at the FCC, we're also taking action to try to see more of this 5G deployment. There were 14 cities that saw 5G deployed last year, uh, and we're expecting to see 30 or 40 cities with this new 5G technology this year alone. Now, what are the risks to completely cutting ties with a carrier like Huawei? For instance, many rural areas rely on companies like Huawei because they tend to be much cheaper. It's equipment. That's right. And we have a proceeding ongoing right now at the FCC where we're looking at these exact issues. Uh, is there a security threat from a particular company or from particular uh, parts of the world? If so, what steps do we need to take? And that's an ongoing proceeding where we haven't reached a final decision yet. But even apart from that, when you think about 5G, it's going to connect more than just phone calls. It's going to be about the Internet of Things, smart cities, telehealth applications. And so part of that question is about 5G values. And when you have companies deploying these networks, do you want companies that are going to respect the rule of law, that are going to respect IP protections, that are going to respect First Amendment rights? And that's part of why we want to make sure the U.S. sees 5G first and why U.S. companies are right up there deploying these new networks. Now, those tweets we talked about earlier not only mentioned 5G, but also pushing ahead to 6G, which is really not even existent at the most basic level. So what's your take on that? Well, from our perspective, we're really just trying to get the regulatory playing field right to unleash this new wave of innovation. And then we'll let the private sector take it from there. 5G is a big piece of the future, but next generation broadband is actually going to take on a lot of different technological forms. There's a new generation of low Earth orbit satellites. Wireline companies are upgrading their networks. So at its core, we just want more broadband for more Americans, and 5G is going to be a piece of that. But there's other technologies out there on the horizon that we're also excited about. So as countries around the world race to develop 5G technologies, I mean, how would you rate our administration's ability and thinking right now to secure those networks from cyber threats? Well, right now we're in really good shape with respect to the deployment of the infrastructure. And we have agencies uh, across the administration and independent agencies as well very focused on this cybersecurity issues. So I think we've got the right people focused on these issues, and we're looking at it at the right time uh, before we see 5G fully deployed. And I want to shift gears a little bit to net neutrality. Since net neutrality has been rolled back, what type of changes have you seen from Internet service providers? It's been really great results for consumers across the country. There was a report that came out not long ago that showed that Internet speeds in the U.S. are now up by 40%. The FCC itself just released a draft report 
that shows the digital divide is closing substantially. And there's still a lot of work to do to get more broadband deployed uh, to hard to serve parts of the country. But investment is up, speeds are up, prices are down. And I spent a lot of time with the infrastructure crews, the telecom crews that are doing the hard work to actually dis deploy the physical infrastructure for the network. And from Florida to Iowa to Alaska, they said they've never been busier. So I think we're really headed in the right direction now. Can you give a little bit more detail on, on investments being up? Because one of the main arguments to scrap net neutrality, obviously, was that ISPs would increase investment. But capital expenditures from the big four most recently show that they've actually been decreasing the amount of investment. Yeah, when you look at the end of the last administration, 2015, 2016, when the FCC imposed these Title II style regulations, investment took a pretty significant downturn for the first time out of a recession. And when you step back and look at the numbers for broadband investment across all providers right now, those numbers have turned around. And that's a great thing. And if you look as well on the infrastructure side, when uh, the FCC started in 2017 with this big push to 5G, China was deploying new cell sites at 12 times our pace. And at the FCC, we've updated our infrastructure rules, so the private sector is now closing that gap. One provider reported that they're clearing new cell sites for construction, for instance, at six times the pace as before. Other providers are doubling their infrastructure deployment, uh, so the numbers are turning around. In fact, Cisco put out a report just this week that says if you look at 5G, because of the regulatory changes the U.S. has made, the U.S. is going to see twice as many 5G connections as Asia, for instance, on a percentage basis. So the new policies the FCC has been putting in place are working, and that's going to pay off for a lot of Americans, but there's certainly more work ahead. That was FCC Commissioner Brendan Carr. Coming up, Flexport, which aims to modernize global freights and shipping, just closed a billion-dollar funding round led by the SoftBank Vision Fund. We'll hear from the company CEO next. Plus, from infamy to internet giant, how Japan's recruit holdings went from $14 billion in debt to a serious challenge for the likes of Alibaba and Amazon. This is Bloomberg. Freight forwarder Flexport has secured $1 billion in funding led by the SoftBank Vision Fund. The company, now valued at $3.2 billion after the funding round, plans to use the capital to deepen its technology and data capabilities, as well as grow its global infrastructure footprint. Emily Chang caught up with Flexport CEO Ryan Peterson on Thursday. Flexport's an international freight forwarding company, and global trade and international freight forwarding are some of the biggest markets in the world, extremely scale-driven. And the, so the bigger your company is, the more advantages you can provide to your customer base. And so we felt like this level of capital lets us really make the investments we need to go after that scale. So why take a billion dollar investment rather than some of the other options that would have been on the table to get to the next phase? Yeah, I th we did have a lot of different options there. I was very attracted by the ability to just really, really go and aggressively expand our business in, in globally. I mean, we need to be in every single country in the world. Our customers are global. Our, the entire premise of working with Flexport is that we can help you expand and go global. Did you weigh the ethics at all of taking SoftBank's money given the connection to the Saudi government? Of course, we spent a lot of time thinking about it, a lot of time working with SoftBank. I went uh, to Japan. I've spent a lot of time with them. Really felt like there was a real alignment in what our mission is, which is making global trade easy for everyone on the planet, connecting humanity in this seamless web of commerce. We've seen over the last 50 years, I don't think anything lifted more people out of poverty than the shipping container and trade. And over the next 50, it's going to be the internet and technology, AI. And we, we're so lucky to get to work at the intersection. And we're fortunate to have a, an investment partner like SoftBank who sees that. So this is a government that's connected to the murder of a U.S. journalist. Did you ask SoftBank about this? Did you get the answers that you wanted to hear? I, yeah, well, I spent a lot of time with SoftBank's people and really built a lot of comfort with them over, over the last several years and really understand them as people, what their vision is and, and where they're going. And so, yeah, we had a lot of great conversations and felt really aligned in our values. Did you personally talk to Masayoshi-san, and what were those interactions like? 
Um, I did. He even invited me to his house. Uh, well, I, you know, I wouldn't want to disclose too much, but of course, he's. Um, we, I did get to put on slippers and go, and, and <laughs> it was interesting to negotiate a deal of this size while wearing slippers. But what was your impression of him, and you know why? you felt like this could work? So I've always been attracted to his worldview ever since I first read. They have a great PDF of their 30 and 300 year vision document explaining what his, and I've never seen a company that has a 300 year vision before, and that was inspiring to me. One of our core values is to play the long game. Um, and I think, it, you know, I mean, in all of everything he's achieved in his career, and to be in the presence of a visionary and hear firsthand some of the stories about um, in, uh, his advice to Alibaba in the early days about how they can do their pricing strategy to win in that market. Um, so he's had, he, he had similar advice for us, which is to be really aggressive and go for scale and growth. So what are the trends that we should be watching for in freight in the next, you know, one to five years? How is this industry going to change? I, I think it's going to change a lot to where the consumer expectation is two-day delivery. And to do that, you can't manage it by the phone. And so you need to be able to have smart analytics that are telling you where to ship cargo, when, to, how it's going to get there, routing decisions, um, whether it should ship by air, or ocean, and ultimately what the what the brand cares about is their cost, their transit time, and the predictability of the system. And those are things that like are the freight industry has only focused on cost historically. And we're saying like, well, let's look at these other factors and see how they affect your growth. That was Flexport CEO Ryan Peterson. Imagine an internet company that owns services comparable to LinkedIn, Yelp, eHarmony, Zillow, and more. Chances are if it was an American company with assets like that under one roof, you'd know its name. But if you've never heard of Recruit Holdings, you're probably not alone. The Japanese tech company owns a constellation of apps, portals, and more, and currently has a valuation of $46 billion and has its sight set on attracting the most consumers in the world by 2030. On Tuesday, Sandra Sucher, professor at Harvard Business School, who's published a case study on Recruit Holdings, joined Bloomberg's Emily Chang and Heidi Stroud-Watts to discuss. The story about Recruit uh, actually really starts with a scandal. Uh, and this is a scandal of massive proportions. The company was founded in uh, 1960, and in around the mid-1980s, uh, its CEO, Hiramasa Ezue, uh, gave shares of a stock that was about to go public in a subsidiary to about 70 government officials and high-ranking uh, executives. Uh, news of the scandal broke in 1988, uh, and it was a sensation. Uh, it caused the resignation of the Japanese prime minister and his entire cabinet, and brought down about another 150 people with them. Uh, it is still recruited uh, in the school books uh, in Japan, and in fact, the first thing that someone says when you say recruit is they'll say, oh, the scandal. So this is how the company had a coming-of-age moment that was unlike that of most other companies. And so I think the first thing you should know about Recruit is that it has been trusted, it's lost trust, and it's learned how to regain trust. And Sandra, even you know, in 2019, you continue to hear about these governance issues, transparency issues in Japan, Inc. So I'm wondering how they managed to stage that turnaround and get past what sounds like was a, a pretty much an existential crisis for the company. Yeah, so uh, what happened was the employees actually thought the company had about six months of life uh, after the scandal broke, but they decided that if anybody was going to save the company, it was going to be them. Uh, so they went to all of their customers and they basically told their customers, look, our founder did this, we weren't involved, we will continue to try to serve you the way we have in the past. And they were very convincing, they were very convinced uh, that they could still run a good business and they lost very, very few customers. Uh, so that was the beginning of a sense of belief in themselves. Uh, they then went through a period of enormous debt when the uh, Japanese asset bubble broke. Uh, and they also managed to pay that off, actually, as recently as 2006. So this is a company that has learned that, on the one hand, uh, it can really do bad things, but it can really be humble and curious and extremely confident in its ability to handle difficult situations. Uh, and that's the spirit that they bring to everything that they do now. 
So then what is the strategy today? They also own a real estate portal. They're providing direct loans to businesses based on daily traffic. How does this all fit together? Well, they have uh, three segments uh, in their business. One is just their, uh, all of their IT businesses that are very, very involved with uh, artificial intelligence and matching platforms on, uh, for jobs. Then they've got one that is in the middle, which is where those businesses would be. And those are really, they call it their ribbon model. And so this is a model that says that they want to create value both for the consumer and for the client who's paying the money to try to match, be matched with the consumer. Uh, and then there's a third business, which is a staffing business for both permanent and temporary staff. And they've always had this mix uh, in the company of being interested in trying to help people largely around education, finding jobs, and then they've just been growing out from there. That was Sandra Sucher, professor at Harvard Business School. Coming up, is Elon Musk too fast to tweet? Another Twitter snafu on the Tesla CEO's part, this time on production rates. We discuss up next. This is Bloomberg. The Tesla turnover continues. General counsel Dane Butswinkas is leaving after just two months on the job. He's a Washington trial lawyer who represented Elon Musk last fall in his battle with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. That legal battle was in regards to CEO Elon Musk's infamous tweet about taking Tesla private and having funding secured. Since then, the SEC has kept a close watch on Musk's Twitter, and now they might have more motive. It turns out that Elon Musk tweeted too soon. Musk tweeted that the electric car maker would make about 500,000 vehicles this year. And just a few hours later, he revised that by tweeting, meant to say annualized production rate at end of 2019, probably around 500,000, i.e. 10,000 cars per week. Deliveries for a year still estimated to be about 400,000. Tasha Keeney, analyst at ARK Investments and Bloomberg's Craig Trudell, joined Emily Chang on Wednesday to discuss. So Musk was supposed to uh, really uh, have uh, a system of, of pre-approval for tweets that would be considered material to the company. Obviously, uh, a 500,000 unit production uh, sort of forecast for this year uh, was uh, was sort of inconsistent with what the company had said previously. Interestingly enough, uh, Musk himself was uh, inconsistent even the day of earnings on January 30th where he did give a, a figure of as much as 400,000 deliveries this year, and then a couple hours later on the earnings call uh, said that they maybe could deliver as many as 500,000 Model 3. So Musk has, has been a little bit all over the, the place with sort of the outlook for this year from a production and delivery standpoint, uh, and this was sort of a continuation of that. But clearly the settlement with the SEC was supposed to guard against these sorts of things happening, and clearly there was, there was an issue uh, in this particular case. Tasha, does this concern you? So, you know, in, in the past, we've sort of heard um, Musk say similar things like this when he talked about the 5,000 uh, Model 3 production per week. You know, then he specified, okay, well, that's, you know, at, at, at a peak rate or at an, in this case, an annualized rate. Um, you know, I think uh, whether or not, um, I, I think in general, what this, this focus on production, um, I, I think traditional analysts and certainly institutional investors put uh, way too much focus on it. Um, so, so our point of view on Tesla is that it's an autonomous electric vehicle company. Um, you know, this is sort of the long-term story that, that we care about. Um, so, so, you know, in talking about production and sort of hitting these specific targets, if they're off by a month or two, um, you know, that's not going to change the long-term thesis. Meantime, Craig, the general counsel leaving after just two months. There's an internal lawyer, Jonathan Chang, taking over this after Musk surprised investors by saying the CFO would be leaving earlier this year. What exactly happened here? We don't know much beyond uh, the sort of vague uh, reference to this being a poor cultural fit for Butswinkus. So um, at, at this point, you know, that, that sort of is reminiscent of, of something that we heard from, from some of the many uh, executives that departed last year. One executive who particularly uh, comes to mind is Justin McIneer, uh, who joined the, the company from Seagate and was supposed to be the, the chief accounting officer. And he left uh, just a couple months into his tenure as well and sort of talked about he, he sort of took for granted just how much attention there was on this company. I think with Butswinkus, you also had a, a situation where 
where he was sort of uprooting from Washington, where he's been a longtime lawyer and was moving to the West Coast uh, and, and sort of a, a focusing on this company on a full-time basis and sort of decided uh, decided against this. So it's unclear whether last night's tweets had anything to, to do with this. Uh, it doesn't appear to be the case, but uh, it, it's also uh, ju just, you know, generally a, another indication that, you know, Elon Musk uh, may be a bit of a difficult person to work for. Tasha, you know, turnover is nothing new at, at Tesla, as Craig has mentioned, you know, but we're talking about key roles, the CFO, the general counsel, previously the head of HR. Does it concern you that he can't keep these roles filled? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'd agree that uh, Musk is a particular person to work for, and uh, you, you sort of need to drive with that style, I think, in order um, to be happy at Tesla. I think, um, well, let's, let's talk about the CFO. In terms of the CFO leaving, um, that you could actually view as, you know, he, he came in um, during a difficult time at Tesla, and he felt like the company was ready to fly in its own, and that's why he was okay leaving again. Um, I think this particular departure, you know, actually when Butswinkos was bought, brought on, people were worried. They said, oh, you know, Tesla's probably Probably going to get a lot of litigation, and now when he's you know leaving, there's again more worry. So it's, it's sort of like okay, we'll pick one. Um, but I, I think in this particular case, you know, it, it could, as you said in the beginning, be sort of a, a sign that um, he didn't get that litigation he expected. He also said he's going to stay on um, in an outside counsel role with Tesla. So you'd think that if there was some sort of relationship damage, that he might not want to do that. Now, on a podcast earlier this week, Musk made some interesting comments that might speak to both of these issues. He said, people think sometimes that I'm like a business person or a finance person or something like that. I'm an engineer. I do engineering, always have. The reason Tesla is making rapid progress is because we have vastly more data and this is increasing exponentially. Tasha, um, you know, t talk to us a little bit about what he said here in this podcast. So the podcast really focused on autonomous driving. And again, um, we, we did that with a purpose because we're long-term investors and, and that's the, the picture that we see ahead of Tesla. Um, you know, our, our bull case price target is $4,000 on the stock in five years and, and most of that is due to autonomous. So um, what Musk is talking about here is Tesla's data advantage. It's something that we focused on for a long time. They're the only automaker collecting data off of their customer cars on the road. Um, that gives them this incredible long tail of events that really no one else has. You know, Waymo just published uh, reports in California along with the rest of the companies testing there on this intervention rate. And you can see that, you know, Waymo at cumulatively has about 10 million miles as of October of last year. Tesla has uh, billions of miles in autopilot. In fact, roughly 8 billion, uh, we think, with hardware one and hardware two cars driven today. So, so that's an amazing advantage. That's what's going to get them across the finish line to autonomous driving. Um, so in, in that case, it's important to have an engineer at the helm of the company that understands that and is willing to invest in that opportunity. Tasha, this was on a podcast with you. Were you satisfied with the answers that he gave you on a range of issues. You know, again, we were happy to, to highlight um, the autonomous driving piece. Um, it, you know, it's, it's great to have a company like Tesla where the CEO actually understands the technology well enough. I mean, he spends a lot of time with the autopilot team, as he told us, uh, to be able to answer these questions well. I, I definitely think that's not the case with the traditional auto companies. Um, I, I think there's a lot of education that needs to be done sort of at that executive level at other firms. Um, so, so, yeah, we, we were happy with the outcome, um, certainly happy that we got to, to spend time with him and uh, ha happy to talk about uh, this story a bit more that we've been focusing on so much. That was Tasha Keeney of ARK Invest and Bloomberg's Craig Trudell. That does it for this edition of Best of Bloomberg Technology. We'll bring you all the latest in tech throughout the week. Tune in each day at 5 p.m. New York and 2 p.m. San Francisco. And Bloomberg Technology is also live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at technology and be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.